Welcome to the Four Mile Circus Podcast. Four Mile Circus Podcast is a production of Four Mile Circus, an independent media services company in Brooklyn, New York. My name is Sean Mannion, and I am one of the hosts of the show. And I'm Nicole Solomon, the other host of the show, the other half of Four Mile Circus. And on today's episode, we are going to be bringing you part two of our interview with author Jocelyn Linder, who has written the book that probably by the time you hear this will have already been released. It's being released on March 14th. It is called The Family Gene, and it chronicles the effects of a deadly genetic mutation that's unique to her family, as well as her family's efforts to stop it. Um, So today we're going to talk to her about her life as a working writer. But first, Sean, Sean has a tip for us today. So for this episode's uh, crowdfunding tip, as opposed to social media tip, like we usually do, uh, I thought I would offer a little advice on uh, making your crowdfunding uh, campaign more of a team effort. Uh, so uh, as I think anybody who's even tried to do a crowdfunding campaign knows, it can be a very solitary endeavor at times. You can be you can start to feel a little bit alone. As much as it's about the crowd, sometimes. Uh, you're uh, sitting in front of a laptop and on your phone, you know, tweeting, Facebooking, sending sending messages, you know, posting things to Instagram, cutting a cutting the pitch video, cutting update video, something like that. It can it can feel a little alone, and, uh, and uh, many of our projects that uh, any of us are doing for uh, crowdfunding purposes uh, are often uh, team projects. Uh, uh, even if you're uh, writing a book, maybe you've got uh, some friends who uh, have been helping you uh, or who have a, a strong interest in uh, in what you're doing or you know maybe they're making the the book the book cover if uh, if it's a film, films are always a team effort. there's the uh, if you're the director, there's the DP, maybe you've got a producer, you've got actors. Um, either way, whatever creative endeavor or other endeavor you have, uh, that you're crowdfunding for, usually uh, there's some other people involved. And while uh, oftentimes one person will be the point person, uh, it's it's always uh, better to spread it around a little bit. Um, and uh, one way to do this is uh, is uh, to, to make that part of your planning. Uh, one thing I did for the uh, Time Signature crowdfunding campaign that I uh, raised money for a short film called uh, Time Signature on Seed and Spark back in 2014, is uh, I engaged everybody who had already committed to the project, uh, all the actors, and uh, including uh, recent uh, guest Hey Young Park uh, and, uh, and the star of the film uh, Kitty Estopowitz, uh, as well as um, just everyone who was uh, engaged with uh, what we were doing. And um, I clued them in on the plan. I had planned out tweets for every single day. I had plan of the 30-day campaign, Facebook posts for all of them. And I shared that with them. And I said, hey, here's something like, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be uh, you figuring out how to share it or what to do. Like, here it is, cut and paste. And that's that's the best thing to do when you're trying to engage other people to help uh, push a project like that is make it as simple as possible for them. Just make it a cut and paste. Make it, give them a document, uh, and 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 say all you have to do is on Monday, cut this out, paste this into your Facebook, cut this out, paste this into your Twitter, take this image, put it on your Instagram, what, something like that. Some people will do it uh, every day. Some people will do it occasionally. You know, uh, the point isn't that they're going to be as active as you as the point person but that it's very easy for them to be active and that you can help them do it. Probably the one change that I would make to that particular strategy uh, that I took for that, uh, for that uh, project was, would be to, um, instead of giving them a single document at the beginning of the campaign, uh, would be to simply maintain contact throughout, give them, give them things to share every couple of days. Or maybe not every day, uh, but uh, but uh, some of them maybe every day. Like some of the people who who are who are, um, it's not necessarily like a, a criticism uh, that they're they're not more engaged. It's simply the fact of life. Is while you're pushing your campaign, while I'm pushing my campaign, 
the other people involved in the campaign, the other people involved in the uh, project at large, uh, they have to they have to pay their bills. They have to, you know, uh, maybe they have to take care of their kids or their or their parents or or their uh, you know significant others or or they have to be taken care of something something along those lines. You know, they're just life happens. So uh, some people will be in it with you every day and just make it easy for them. Just send them, just send them something, cut and paste. You know, uh, if they if they ask how else they can help, have a very simple task for them to do. Don't. Uh, it's it's a high pressure situation being in uh, doing a crowdfunding campaign. It can be it can be it can be stressful, and uh, you can alleviate some of that stress by doing this for yourself, uh, by bringing other people in. Uh, but you don't want to overwhelm them because then. It's it'll just create more stress for yourself. The easier you make it for the people who are helping you, the easier you make it on yourself. And uh, don't uh, don't fall into the trap of uh, assuming that uh, you can't ask anybody to do anything, and you might as well just do it yourself because you're the one who's going to do it the best. Find tailor things to work with the people that you're working with. And that's going to help. Uh, Time Signature was funded very much on, uh, you know, helping the team to spread the word and showing them, here, why don't you do this? Uh, you know, tweet this out. Uh, post this to Facebook. Uh, here's a thing that I'm working on to try to drum up more more uh, uh, interest. Why don't you come participate in it? You know, we'll do weekly video updates. I did weekly video updates with the lead actress, uh, Kitty Estopowitz. And that was very effective. We, uh, you know, as uh, side by side, personally thanked everybody. And it was a simple thing for us to do to get together, to sit down, put a camera on us and just and just say thank you and give a quick update. And uh, think about what you can do to engage your team uh, to uh, be more than more than uh, just names on a list. You know, uh, if they can uh, help be one of the faces for what you're doing uh see how you can make that work um that doesn't always work out uh but there's there's uh there's some strategy in there that works for your project and for the team that you're working with and uh, adapt what you're trying to do to fit uh those people and that is my uh, crowdfunding tip for this episode uh so i'm just going to give it back to you uh nicole so great, great tip, Sean. Um, I I don't believe you. I don't think you liked it. You didn't say a word. <laughs> I was so stunned by its uh, poignance and brevity. And yeah, that's I I just didn't have time. I was like a deer in headlights, like we we're talking about last episode. That was me with your tip. Absolutely, it was stunning. Yes. Um. So now that we're unstunned. We can we can actually talk to Jocelyn, who's who's here today. Um, hi, yeah. Hi. Hello. Thank thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Um. So you you have managed to actually make a career for yourself as a writer, which is not 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 an easy feat. And your memoir, your excellent memoir, I should say. I I vouch for this book. I like it very much. It is very funny and very informative and very emotional it's it's one of those things where it's genuinely like you'll laugh you'll cry but like really sincerely and all the laughs and tears are like a hundred percent earned it's rarely have i read a book that is both so heavy and so buoyant with humor at the same time oh, thanks i no, thank you for writing it it's fucking awesome um so anyway now that i've talked about how great that is i want to talk to you about that in a minute First, I wanted to ask you about some of your earlier work because you've written some other books. And can, can you tell us about those and how, how those came about specifically? Sure. So I should start by saying that um, when I went to sell the memoir uh, with my agent, I was told never to talk about these books again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, but I think it's hilarious. So, of course, I can talk about these books. I okay. wrote them all. and But it was <laughs> largely because they were um, writer for hire, which is... It's not that it's frowned upon. It isn't at all frowned upon to do writer for hire work. And, I'll, and I will talk a lot if you want about why it's a good thing, I think. Um, but it, what can happen is a lot of times in writer for hire situations, you're paid a lot less and there's not as much pressure on the book to do well. 
But what that also means is you end up with a lot of books with low book sales because nobody's promoting them except maybe you. So that's what happened with with I think several of these books. So I, I had this sort of like, she's like, just don't mention them. And then they won't look when you're trying to sell your book, you know, so it's, it's okay. It's fine. But um, sorry to mess uh, up your branding strategy. You, you ruined me. I actually am. So I love that I wrote these books. Like I think they were they were so much fun. So silly. Like most of them were had a humor base, which is like my favorite way to write. And as I was writing each one, I was like, I, this is like the luckiest thing. Like I'm sitting here I'm in my backyard in the sunshine writing like a list of like one of the books was like a 10 item list book. It was like every page had a 10 item list. And I just wrote like 200 or 300 of these lists. What were the lists of? It was like a, it was like a, the book was called the best life lists, best or best life's list. I'm not sure. So it's a actually. tongue twister. <laughs> tongue twister written by Dee Dee Claremont again, because of see my last note about like book sales being low. <laughs> they were like, you need a different name on this book, but it was so, it was ridiculously fun because it was like, you know, um, like 10 tips for putting on lipstick or like 10 tips for a great updo. Like it had to be like very simple, light 17 magazine type lists for, for women in their twenties and thirties. Um, yeah. So it was, it was super fun. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous and it actually got out of hand because at one point I was like just making crazy lists. It was so many lists that it, I, I think I advised in one list how to travel alone. And then in another list, I was like the 10 best places to swim and like in, in the world. And then I included like some really like war torn, <laughs> dangerous <laughs> river with like syringes, somebody and somebody caught it. They were like, I don't think that's a great place to swim. And I was like, oh, I mean, if you love danger, it is. <laughs> yeah. No Some people love danger. So that was but that book was fun to write. And they all they all were kind of fun. I mean, none of them. There weren't high stakes. Let's say that. So how, how did you get into doing writing for hire and writing writing these books? So like, um, there was that I know you did like a purity test book and like a book about like cohabitating and like a lot of stuff some books about gamification a lot of, lot of yeah, the gamification books were actually the exception they were um a fr I got that that job through a friend of a friend um it was actually a friend's boyfriend and uh he was like a sort of a guru in this gamification movement or field and um and I had published at that point you know a, a book called the good girl's guide to living in sin about cohabitation and I had published um I think I was publishing or had just published a book called The Stone Family Robinson, which was like a mashup kind of kind of ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> but he uh, he wanted to publish. And so we were, I had advised him. I said, you know, one of the you kind of have two choices when you're an unknown entity. And, and one is um, you have to uh, build your audience and be like you have to be able to answer the question why should I write this book right so he kind of had that answered um, but the other thing you can do as a sort of an unknown quantity is you can find a writer to kind of co-write with and then often they'll help you with the channels by like you know their agent so so you kind of work together like his 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 cachet as a gamification guru and then my you know agent and sort of knowledge of writing books kind of came together and worked out really well so we wrote two books together and they actually did okay <laughs> but I think he was often credited as the primary writer so they didn't give me the same level of like mm. you know cool sure but so he came to you based on your track record with like previous books how, how do you get into that field like how do you get a job is like you're okay we need someone i assume it was the kind of thing of like somebody had a concept already for a book to be written we're like jocelyn will you write this book that we've already come up with it wasn't you pitching these ideas mostly yes. so i had met an agent um socially and i'm um, i was working in film and she like we were somewhere and she said, have you, you know, have you ever written a book or thought about writing? And I, I think we were in a conversation and I made a joke that I didn't date. I like cohabitated. Like I was just like in this habit of like every guy I dated, I would just live with, or mm -hmm. I lived with already and then started dating. <laughs> it's very awesome twenties. Um, so I, so I had, t I was telling her that story at a party and she, I think she had recently heard of a title that was being shopped for, they were shopping for a writer and it was called the good girl's guide to living in sin. And she said, would you want to write this book? And I said, 
oh, I was like, yes, that would be so fun. And so I, you know, again, like I was working in film and I had time. So um, she paired me with a, so I wrote the pitch and she liked the pitch, but she said, I, I can't sell you, you're nobody. Cause it's like the question, why me? Like, why yeah, should I, like, right. I, there's no reason. I'm a, a girl who wants to write a book who, you know, has lived with a few guys. Like I didn't really have that background. So she's like, I'm gonna pair you with this other writer who's who's an editor at Bridal Guide Magazine and is a relationship expert just because she has that, you know, credential. And it kind of worked out in my favor because the, that, that particular person I think came in thinking it's my book or something. I mean, maybe she didn't, maybe she understood that it was a writer for hire, but I think because I had already written the pitch, she kind of came on and was like very, I mean, she's an amazing writer and an amazing person, but she was sort of deferential in that way that you're brought into something. So I kind of had that lucky thing happen, but anyway, so she came in and I still got to pretend like I was like a real writer and she was like, I mean, it's our book. I, I need to stop saying bad things about that but you know what I mean she she, she sort of came in and, and allowed me to be equal with her which I think it could have worked the other way very easily absolutely and that's that's awesome that you had that experience um so it seems like that sort of thing is it's good to get hooked up with an agent to get that kind of work do you have any advice for writers about how how to get an agent um, either because I know there's also different kinds of agents for different kinds of things like there's the agent who's going to sell your book that you wrote and you're like I've got this book I, I want to find a publisher for it but then there's like an agent to get you work for hire you know kind of stuff like how how does somebody go from being like a, a blogger or you know maybe somebody who's pitched a couple websites and has like a couple credits but you know not somebody where you've got people coming to you yet kind of thing like how how do you how do you do that? How, tell me how to network, Jocelyn. I, don't I know, know how to network. I, this is a hard question. I mean, I, my first instinct is like move to Brooklyn yeah. <laughs> because they're like at the dog park. They're kind of everywhere. But I think that um, so stock the dog park. stock the dog park. I mean, how, how many how many of them how many of them do I have to sleep with? <laughs> Serious. Like I'm not saying that you did. I'm just saying like like I'm not a good writer. So, <laughs> so how much of my body do I need to use? People. Okay. Okay. Yeah depending on how good a writer you are. I mean, I'm pretty bad. <laughs> 15. Do you really think that's going to help you though, Sean? <laughs> just just genuine question. Maybe you should bake cookies. You you bake really nice cookies. I do. So maybe so go to the dog park with a bunch with, of cookies, cookies and be like, "Hey, hey, are you an agent? I got a cookie for you because that's not creepy at all." <laughs> <laughs> so I think it if you, anyway, if you are a writer and you are um and that's what you do if you you need a manuscript of some sort if you are a person who has i think nowadays writing also or, or having a book can also be a part of a branding device is a if you're a business owner or you're trying to sort of be this expert in your field it often gives you a lot of clout to say oh i wrote the this book yeah. about it and it's a good calling card so there are people that are doing that much more than ever before um and so in that regard you know I, so for that one, I would say find a writer with an agent and that's how you get an agent, you know, mm. sort of sort of hitch your wagon, you know, and then that's a great way to do it. If you're a writer, you need to start with a manuscript and you need to have or at least a really comprehensive uh, fleshed out idea if you're writing. So it's two things. If you're writing fiction, often it's um, you need a complete manuscript to turn in. If you're writing nonfiction, you need a, a very well fleshed out idea or a pitch. So you can sort of see sample pitches online or if you know anyone who's written them, ask to look at theirs. Um, but, you know, it's that's the kind of thing. And, and I think it really, it's, certainly with the pitch one, really ask yourself, why me? Why am I the expert on this topic? I mean, I'm not personally, I am not a science writer, but I am now, so now that I've written this sort of science-based memoir, I actually can sell myself as a science writer because I have a science-based memoir. But the reason I can do that is because it's a memoir and I had a personal story that had these stakes that allowed me to sort of explore genetics and the history of genetics and the history of genomic medicine or genomic. We were talking before about how to say that word. I may have mispronounced it on the last episode. I'm pretty sure it's pronounced genomic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, but you know, the, so the whole point being that you sort of, you have to know why you, so that it is a really important question because it's really easy to be like, I have an amazing idea about cheese that I want to write. You know, it's like, great, but 
why should I buy it from you? <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's going to be the question they're going to ask. So also, you know, building your audience, becoming a, becoming a person that somebody wants to buy a book from. So you can take some steps earlier before you're actually in the process of getting an agent or while you're getting an agent, start, you know, building those, those things. Yeah. We talked about some of that in the last episode about how you can use social media to like build community. Um, blogging is another way that's like a, a usually free mm-hmm. way that you can start getting your writing out there and build an audience for your writing. And that's a thing I assume you can take to an agent or if you're writing up a pitch or whatever, you'd be like, I, you know, my blog attracts however many unique visitors a month. So like those are all potential, you know, yeah. people. Or I assume that increasingly people want to see social media numbers too. That's what, oh, yeah. that's what people people have been telling me um so yeah so uh, you were saying that you think being doing writing for hire is a good move even if like sometimes it's seen as like not the branding uh best thing that's a sentence that i came out of my mouth so maybe 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 writing for hire is maybe not the the best thing for branding but you don't necessarily think that is that kind of what you're gonna yeah what do you think is good about it because i don't think it's bad for branding that's different because that's your audience i think it's bad for industry right so for like if, if if the publisher goes to check your numbers and they suck that is not good for you when you're trying to sell a book. Right. And that's something you don't necessarily have much control over or doesn't, yeah. it's not your fault. Somebody, right. But so that's it. And you're... I don't think it's going Im- to, it can't really impact you negatively unless you're really verbal, unless you're, unless you're going to be running around like I wrote, you know, cause you can always do the job, write the book, put your name on it or not. And then, um, and then just like, don't mention, if it doesn't do very well, just don't bring it up when you're trying to actually sell something for a lot of money, just don't mention it. And it's okay that it exists. It's just they don't want you to, you know, for them, it doesn't make any sense for you to tell them about it. It's that, just like... That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you were saying earlier that, like, you you would be happy to talk about some of the reasons you think it is a good thing for writers to do and you're in favor of it. So I was wondering about what you think some of the advantages of going in that direction if or under what circumstances which writer profiles, say, might choose to do that rather than investing your time and energy into I'm going to write and refine an original manuscript and try to sell it instead try to find like pre-existing projects to get hired to write for i can think of some reasons why i think it's a good idea but i'd rather hear from someone who knows what they're talking about i mean yeah i don't i, I mean they're probably the same but i think yeah. um you know i think first of all anytime you're doing the thing that you want to do for money it just feels really good and i think yep. you know when you're writing for hire you're certainly giving up creative control in the sense that you're you typically told the like what you're basically writing you know so you kind of but but often you have your own control within that form that structure but you know you have to sort of give up the bigger you know creative control like for example i i when i wrote the stone family robinson um i I was given a horrible manuscript, like some translation that was like from 1942 or what. I was so old and it was so verbose and really complex. And I was the my job was to go in and change the actual text and and write this. And by the end, I had just scrapped it and was just writing my own, <laughs> like <laughs> like the Disney like movie version of this book because it was just such a tedious slog to get through this horrible manuscript that they gave me. So, but. And I just didn't mention it. So when they were reading the first, you know, probably four or five chapters were this horrible manuscript. Sorry, it's a decent book. It's parts, it gets really good toward the end, I think. And then, (laughs) and then it just, you know, then I I just gave that up. So I figured they didn't even really notice. Nobody really cared that much. But, you know, so you do how you give up some creative control, but ultimately you're getting to do this thing that you love. And then I think also, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to sort of test some water. So for example, when I was doing the gamification books, I did two and a list came out um, like a year later or within the year that the second book came out. And it was like the top 100 influencers in gamification. And I was number 98. I was 98. No, that's fantastic. It was the coolest thing ever. So then I was like, I'm going to be a gamification (laughs) expert because I thought that I could parlay this into like a career. I could like write more books about it, maybe even develop games, like, you know, really just make this a thing. And that lasted for like a second. I think you know one of the games I, I tried to develop. No, it was a good. It was it was a good idea. It just it, I was like trying to gamify like falling in love or gamify like losing weight. I thought like we could develop like a card, you know. It would be actually everyone said it would be good for an app. Like it would. Yeah. Anyway. Mm. 
We can. If anyone wants to reach out to me, we could totally discuss this further. I have some more ideas with the gamifying of <laughs> of life. Are you telling me to wrap it up, Sean? I'm sorry. Yeah, I've blown I was your signaling cover. Like I was signaling Our like secret. we talked about. But you said you were so going to do this, and you pointed that, and I'm like, is there a fire in the other there room? There is a fire in the other room. Okay, so we need to. <laughs> Can, can I ask Jocelyn one more? That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah um, I, I, a little left field now. Um, but so you're a very prolific writer. You're writing all the time or you're rewriting and it's not writing and revising are kind of two different kinds of processes, which we've talked about outside of this podcast recently on our writing group listserv. But um, you're doing all that stuff a lot. I have a problem a lot where I... I'm like, I need to write. And then I have a massive like anxiety attack basically and my whole brain freezes up and I'm like, the creativity is gone. I am removed from the source of inspiration and never again shall it flow. Like that's how it feels basically to be in my head. Um, <laughs> I assume you feel similar feelings sometimes too because I think most people who do creative work do. How the fuck do you deal with it and get the fuck over it? Because obviously you're good at that. <laughs> oh, thanks. How? Tell me. Um, okay. It's a hundred percent one thing and that, and you know this, like it's writing group. Like I mm. feel like I have a writing group I've been in for 10 years and it, it's every Tuesday. And so I'm submitting work probably every six weeks. So every six, and, and if you ask me what I'm doing in between my, when I submit and like not submitting, I'm doing nothing. I do nothing. But when it's time <laughs> for me to submit, I will sit down and write 20 pages, 30 pages. And because of that in 10 years, I've written three novels, one like memoir, <laughs> plus, you know, tons of short stories and essays. And I've just, because I have to submit, I have to write something and it keeps happening. So I think that having that culpability is the thing. Cause I think anytime you say to a person and people say, oh, it's because I'm too busy or I have eight kids. But if I said to you, like, you need 10 minutes a day to sit down and write one page a day. And in a year you'll have a book. Like we've all heard that nobody does that like nobody's like i'm gonna dedicate 10 minutes a day they're like gonna get in bed and watch netflix or go to sleep like nobody has time so that's not you can't can't be like that you have to have you know in our case six other people that care if you don't submit yeah. and that makes you have to do it and so that i always say that to people like get a writing partner just a person who you're culpable to or a group of people that you that you have this responsibility to and then take it seriously like don't let yourself go ah like uh we you know we'll just let this go like we none of us let it go if it's tuesday night we go to writing group we show up and we have work and if you we say we're gonna go we it, i don't know i could count on literally a hand in 10 years the number of people that have backed out like the week they're supposed to go because we don't allow that in our writing group yeah and so it's like if you say you're going you have to go which is why people are nervous to say they're going, but but they do because they also know if they say no too many times, then we'll start to judge that. So, you know, and I love that accountability. I think it's vital in a, any creative process if you don't have a job where you're expected to write or have a deadline. So that's my, that is my solution and I promise it works. Yeah, and I think, I think having in-person meetings is better, but if you're, because I have talked to people who are like, I wish I could have that, but I'm in a town where like, I don't know other writers. I don't know how to make that get going. And it seems like you can do that virtually. You can have like somebody, cause it's about the accountability. Mm -hmm. So if it's like, okay, we're two of us, you know, we're going to get a group of six people who live in six different cities. And once a week, um, two of us are going to email something to everybody and we'll read it and we'll give you notes. Like you can do that. It's not, you know, it loses something that you get from the in-person interaction, but so for listeners at home who are like, that's great. I don't live in Brooklyn. Like you can modify that because mm -hmm. the bottom line, it's about having people you have to answer to, right? Mm -hmm. To like put muscle behind that deadline because if it's just, and I've tried to do the like, I'm going to, recently I was supposed to write a page a day and have a screenplay written by now. And that yeah, where's my screenplay? Yeah, that hasn't, that hasn't happened. But if, it, yeah. But Nicole has never said she was going to submit and then not submitted. And oh, we've been doing no. this. We, You and I have been doing this together for what, five, four years, five years? Five years, I think. Yeah, so I mean, it's, time. I don't know. No, I do it. If I have a deadline, I meet my deadline. It's true. That's why I'm sometimes, am, like you said, nervous, being like, I don't want to go next week because then I know I'm going to have to do a thing. But I, that's an excellent, excellent piece of advice for everybody. Um, and I wish we could talk about that longer, but Sean wants to play a game. I so. want to play a game. Because Sean doesn't have the attention span <laughs> but, for this writer. But it, it's a relevant game. 
It's a literary trivia game. <gasps> it's very specifically, it's called, I'm calling it Uncle Sean because because on Twitter and on Instagram and such, I am Uncle Sean. Um, Uncle Sean's literary trivia because the trivia is about literature, but it's also a little bit about me because uh, I have a degree in literature. So it's That's so true. It's relevant He's to not, this. I thought he was pulling my leg the first time I heard that, but no, no it's, I have, it's, a, I, it's have facts. A, I have a diploma for something and everything. I mean, it's arguable whether or not it's from a real school, but uh, <clears throat> So, uh, are are you guys ready? I guess. There are multiple choice know. questions. Uh, so, you know, there's uh, four choices for each one. So, it's a 25% chance you'll get it right if you guess. guess. Uh, actually, probably the numbers on that are different. There's probably, what there's probably a whole math the, thing. What does do the thing? Uh, no, I want to talk about math. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, first question. Are you guys ready? Yes. Which of these William Faulkner books have I read? <gasps> awesome. The Sound and the Fury, Light in August, Garbage Pail Kids, the movie official film novelization, <laughs> or None of the Above. So that's... I'm going D. D, None of the Above? I'm, I'm going with A. You're going to go with Sound A, The Fury. Sound and the Fury? All right. And the answer is D. I've only really read his short his short stories. I have The Sound and the Fury. I've started The Sound and the Fury. As I Lay Dying, is that... That's Faulkner. That's my that's my only Faulkner so, yeah. I've read. I believe so. I'm ignorant about literature. I went to an alternative <laughs> school and took classes like films and books where we read ordinary people and then watched ordinary people. As I Lay Dying is really good. But, you know, Faulkner. I, I, I've read Rose for Emily. That's Faulkner, right? That's about the dead lady with the, with the, with the dead lover. No. It's very exciting. Okay, so question two. Uh, which classic science fiction novel... Did I read a paper, write a paper on comparing it philosophically to Heart of Darkness in my History of Criticism class? A, Stranger in a Strange Land. B, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? C, Ender's Game. D, None of the Above. I gotta, you know, the, the second one was Philip K. Dick. Correct. Mm -hmm. And Correct. that's, that's what, what was based Runner. on that, Blade Runner? Basis for Blade Runner, yes. Okay. I'm gonna go with the, the Philip K. Dick. I was going to go with um, Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land. Okay, okay. and uh, But I love Ender's Game, even though I, he's I, a Mormon. I haven't read it. Yeah, he's I, so I have weird. friends who But it's love such Ender's a good Game book. I mean, even ever. as an adult, it holds up. You can read it again as an it. adult. I check it out. It's really great. All of my friends would talk about it in high school. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, oh, it's Ender's Game. I don't know what you're he's such about. a good writer. I think, I'm think i hoping he's not as awful as people say. I don't think he is. I'm going to go with he's not. I don't know. He, says, he, he seems to say a lot of awful things. <laughs> But anyway, anyway. You so, know, Orson was named after Orson Scott Card until, and then I heard he was crazy, and now it's my dog, and now he's oh. now he's named after um, Orson Welles. Oh, because oh, because I wanted to name him know? Ender. <laughs> my husband's like, we're not naming the dog Ender. It's all funnier, also, if you know Orson the dog, who's just like the biggest pile of sweetness and he's a sweet and enthusiasm, and so yeah. you definitely don't want to name him after somebody who's a little questionable. Mm -mm. Um, so so the answer was. B, do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, I'm winning. I've got, I'm winning. two for two. She's two for two. I know you so well, Sean. It's, it's true. <laughs> which is, which is funny because I think this is only like the third time we've been in the same room. Uh, <laughs> so the, the third and final question, um, even though Nicole has already clearly lost. I've, yeah, I can't win. I can't. <laughs> um, unless, can't are, are there, are there triple points for this one? Cause it's like triple hard. Okay. We'll, we'll do, we'll do triple points. <laughs> cool. uh -oh. All right. Yeah. Sure. All right. This one, this one, unfortunately now it seems that Jocelyn has a handicap cause this one actually isn't about me. Um, <clears throat> in Kafka's The Metamorphosis, why does Gregor transform into an insect? A, it's unclear. B, does he really, or is it just a metaphor for a change in personality? C, he's a jerk. D, he's cursed by a witch. I lived in Prague. But isn't it A and B? I mean, I feel like it's a little subjective, this one. I was, that, that B is a little I'm, subjective. I'm, I'm going to go with I, B. I, I, did, I did say this was unfair, right? You could also arguably I, say um, C, but like D is not What was C again? Oh, C is no he's memory. a jerk. Oh. Yeah. Which is subjective. That's true. True. I mean, I'm going to say A if I have to. This is the kind of question that made me hate multiple choice in elementary school and realize it was fucked because they give you these subjective I'm going to say B. I'm confidently saying B, even so though it's a, subjective. A, A and B. Well, uh... It,
I I would I would go with A, but I was also willing to accept B. So everybody wins. <laughs> no, or C because Jocelyn got it right, and she got and the she got the other two right, questions right. And I right. just got, the, or does and that? So, no, and, so she wins. And and your fabulous prizes. Uh, this there's there's a there's a cheap big pen over there that I'm not sure works. So <laughs> the gamification of this podcast. <laughs> I, I I think that's I think, makes us I think all we winners. Need to do actually, more of these. I was so excited when you brought up a book I'd read. I was like, I've read the Metamorphosis. I I, I did too. I read it. Is it a short? It's a short story. Yeah, right? yeah, short, it's a short yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read the Metamorphosis and other stories. Oh, I believe. Nice. I think I only read the Metamorphosis out of the stories. I had a I had a class at my alternative junior high where where the first one of the first things that we were analyzing as far as literature was like, oh, we're gonna read close read the Metamorphosis, and I was like, this dude turns into a bug. Does he turn into a bug though? No, that's. It's maybe a metaphor. It's maybe. It's maybe. 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 It's maybe he does. That's I why know. I was so thrown by A and B, and then there was no all of the above. Oh, yeah, I thought yeah. anyway. I could talk it's, about. It's your... an unfair. It's the whole. The whole game is unfair. <laughs> all the games from now on are going to be unfair. I have some notes yeah. on your game that we can discuss off podcast. I suppose <laughs> since we need to. Um... Wait, you want it to be fair? No, I. I just have <laughs> a lot of feelings about it, and I need to you know share you them process. i need to process it's you know because me. you guys are oldest and <laughs> games are harder for you i'm much more open she, no i'm so a middle child a middle oh you're middle i'm oh, middle yeah. i don't She's know what worst. happens <laughs> middles have a hard time with games though because usually they get paired with the parent and the oldest and the youngest get paired like if you're playing a is that did that happen for you i don't know like, I had, I mean, yes, I, I mean, had a hard time. I mean, that your, part. Your like if you were playing like a team game, games with you. I guess on. you probably weren't. <laughs> you probably weren't playing that many point. team games. We played. No, we 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 did, but mostly like with my sisters. My sisters and I would play team games. But and how would you be a team with three? Um, it seems like the parent or the babysitter or somebody would have to up be on your like. Oldest, didn't you? No, usually it was either it was. <laughs> It, we're not going to go here. I could tell you about how it was, but there's there's a lot to say. I want to say like um, there was a lot of bending of rules. Maybe somebody was paired with a you know a stuffed animal or something like that. Uh-huh. Maybe things oh, like that cute. happened. Nice. Um, I think somebody's we, you, isn't it? Nobody wanted to be on your team. Oh, a lot of times, absolutely. That's you kind of didn't want to be on anybody else's team, though. Oh did you? well, that's a nice way to look you're at kind it. Of, you're kind of a lone <laughs> ranger. Oh, that's that's a nice way for me to retrofit my childhood. Thanks, Sean. That's, middle children that's are what I'm here for. One. They tend to be bitter because of these these types of things. Oh yeah, middle no, I yeah. Mm-hmm. Nicole's not bitter at all. I don't we, I'm gonna that. start a new podcast. Um, Nicole's bitter for middle circus. <laughs> being a Aww. middle child and my enneagram type is four for a you know left field comment that nobody knows what i'm talking about no idea what you're talking about I'll, I'll tell you later it's actually one of the reasons i like the name of our company okay so i'm like oh that's like my enneagram type well, uh, our the name of our company is also a literary reference that people can try and figure out but that's a mystery one we that's can't say we can't say oh, interesting but uh, anyway great game sean i know it's okay. super fun that Congrats. was really great i love There's... when i win so thank yeah. you yeah you not only were our guest you were also the winner <gasps> yay this is the best. Just, I bet, I bet you didn't know when you came over here that you were going to win this game. I know. And it's a amazing. crappy pen. You can put that on your, on <gasps> your new website. Oh, it's yeah, over there. It's over there. It in a second. Okay. I, I got the headphones in. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so where where can we find the, the, Jocelyn, you, the winner, um, on, on the internet? Where can we? Um, Jocelynder as my Twitter handle, J-O-S-E-L-I-N-D-E-R. Um, it's economical because I mushed the L's together. And then... Um, uh, Jocelyn Linder on Facebook and I, I say yes to everybody as long as you don't have like no friends or like only like weird sexy pictures of yourself I will friend you and um, Instagram I think it's also Jocelyn Linder great and your and your book came out on March 14th um, yes. and it is called the family gene and everyone should check it out um, I'm Nicole you can find me at Nicole W Solomon on Twitter um, Nicole witty that's n i c o l e w i t t e on Instagram uh, I'm on Facebook I probably will not friend you back if I don't know you in real life but you can, if you send me a nice message and explain why I should be your friend I might um, and Sean let's hear about you I'm, I'm Uncle Sean as I said oh I'm Uncle Sean like everywhere but don't friend me on Facebook because I'm not there I mean I'm there but I'm not I don't want I don't want more fa- random Facebook friends. And we're we're four mile circus. That's oh, you said that already, didn't you? No, no, I said that last oh. time. Four mile circus. Number four, the word mile, the word circus. All, dot com. All together. All, to, all together, and that's at dot com on the internet, and also on Twitter, Instagram, 
Yeah. Uh, we have a Facebook page, YouTube. Yes. You should like the Facebook page. Please like our Facebook page. When we when we get a thousand likes, Sean's gonna dye his beard red. We still red. have the dye over there. We have the dye. It's we can show it to Jocelyn and she can vouch for it. I liked it already. I liked the page. I feel like it's been good for me liking it. I think it would be good for all of you to I, like I, it. I think it makes everybody better people. It does really. Yeah, and Jocelyn's a winner, so you should listen to her advice because then maybe you too can be a winner. Maybe. 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 It, it remains to be seen. You have to like the page and let us know. Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk to you all again soon when we are talking to somebody else. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. If you like what you heard, please subscribe on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice and check out other Four Mile Circus services and projects at fourmilecircus.com as well as Four Mile Circus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Watch our first VOD release, Nicole's award-winning feminist phone sex horror comedy, Small Talk, at 4milecircus.com store.